I was born up on high ground where the Cheat River winds. Many of my kin worked in the old coal mines. I grew up hunting, fishing, and trapping. By the headwaters of my line. Cheat River Watershed originates deep in the Monongahela National Forest. There are five forks, uh, tri main tributaries that come together, um, but the, the deepest one, Shaver's Fork, originates um, just outside of Snowshoe, West Virginia. Those forks flow through the, the Mon Forest, which is largely protected, really healthy, um, and they join right around Parsons, West Virginia, which is in Tucker County. Uh, one interesting tidbit about the cheat is it flows north so we often have people trying to turn the map to figure out you know what direction the river is going so the river uh, the, the tribs meet around Parsons continue flowing north into Preston County and then there is a small watershed that drains out of Pennsylvania called Quebec Run that meets with the Big Sandy which drains into the lower end of the Cheat Canyon and uh, right behind me is the start of the Cheat Canyon, um, where the, the river really narrows and flows about 12 miles of class five world-class whitewater till we get to Cheat Lake, where uh, we do have a uh, flow impeding dam. So Cheat Lake uh, is a reservoir that is really right at the bottom of the watershed. Um, and then just a little bit beyond Cheat Lake, the, the river meets the Monongahela and flows towards Pittsburgh. The Cheat River watershed has always been a wild place. In the 1800s, considerable changes to the landscape began. Railroads, logging, tanneries, coal mining, and iron ore industries popped up throughout the watershed from its headwaters to mouth. As people found their way in, they discovered great value in the Cheat's natural resources, which they managed to remove um, primarily when the railroads were established. By the 1930s, coal mining was approaching its peak. While bringing prosperity to many communities, severe, long-lasting damage was done to many streams in the Cheat watershed. AMD, or acid mine drainage, was prevalent throughout the Upper Freeport coal seam because the overburden was made of pyritic material, pyrite, AKA fool's gold. All you need to do to create acid mine drainage is expose that pyrite to air and water. So you have pyrite plus water plus air and you create sulfuric acid and hydrogen ions. The sulfuric acid is of course what we associate with the burning of the, of the eyes, but those hydrogen ions also drop the pH of the water. So you essentially get acid plus metals. What does that, what does acid mine drainage actually do to impair the health of rivers? Well, the pH is low, so if you think about the membranes of fish or the bugs that live there, it essentially eats away their exoskeleton, which is typically made of calcium. So, uh, pilgrimites uh, <laughs> couldn't live in this type of water. The only way we would know that they were here is to see a red skeleton. The Cheat was West Virginia's first commercially rafted river. Every season we saw tens of thousands of paddlers paddling through the Cheat Canyon. So in the spring of 1994, there was still an active mine operation not far from where we are now uh, along Muddy Creek that was uh, actively mining coal and they got a little creative and they uh, had drilled a essentially a drainage hole, borehole, that went from their mine complex to an abandoned mine complex. Um, and they did that because they were able to then make their polluted water disappear and they didn't have to treat it. So that worked for a while um, until that large space filled up with water. And once that, that underground mine filled up with water, um, there was no place for the pollution to go. 
So in that very wet spring of 1994, so it blew out the side of the hill and poured tens of thousands of gallons of highly, highly concentrated acid mine drainage into Muddy Creek. Um, the water was bright orange, um, full of, of metal, full of iron. Um, and once that water reached the Cheat Canyon, um, it essentially stained all of the rocks of the Cheat Canyon, left um, what can only be described as like a bathtub ring of sludge along the rocks. And anything that was still alive in the river um, was, was, was killed by that, uh, that blowout. So the folks, some of the folks live, living locally, um, teamed up with paddlers and said like, this is enough, um, this is not okay. Um, we, we can't have our rivers running red and, and fish dying and you know paddlers having to bring um, water bottles to flush their eyes out because the water is actually stinging the, the membranes of their eyes. It was so acidic, you know, uh, the pH scale goes from one to 14. And you want your water to be a seven, which is neutral. This water is, you know, less than three. We're talking about the, the pH of vinegar um, is how bad it was. If the pH changes from seven to six, that's an increase in acidity 10 times. If it decreases from seven to five, that's an increase in acidity of 100 times. If it changes from seven to four, that's a thousand times increase in acidity. Uh, if we're gonna talk about uh, brook trout, uh, they can tolerate uh, a little lower pH than a lot of other fish. They can tolerate something down to maybe five and a half. Now that wouldn't be a real great population, but six to seven would be a good pH for brook trout. Muddy Creek was probably two or three. The organization came together around really 94, 95, and it started with just volunteers. You know, there was no paid staff. Um, the first money that the group ever raised was from a trash cleanup. They went out and they gathered scrap metal. They took it to the dump and that, you know, 20 some bucks lived in a mason jar on our, one of our founders refrigerators for a year until they could figure out how to form a 501c3 and what to do with it. These founders, the, the people in the beginning who banded together, people like Dave Bassage, Deb Wise, Michael Messer, Troy Tichnell, and many other locals that live right in Ruth Bell, paddle makers like Jimmy Snyder, boat builders like the Salajis. They came together not only because this impacted their, their livelihood, but this was in their backyard. It was a place that they spent time. It, it was their home. As they were gathering information and understanding the impacts to the cheat more, we quickly learned that we needed everybody's help. We needed all hands on deck. Nonprofits like Friends of the Cheat, West Virginia Rivers Coalition, American Whitewater, to government, county government, state government, agencies from Office of Surface Mining to the West Virginia DEP and DNR, our university partners, and industry, notably Anchor Energy. Anchor Energy funded Friends of the Cheat's very first acid mine drainage treatment project on Greens Run, on the Middle Fork of Blood Lagoon and that project was the first. Following that project, we finally had some government money available to work on the problem. Being the squeaky wheel brought attention from other groups that took different approaches than Friends of the Cheat. And as a result of everybody's collective effort, we now have a $10 million treatment plant on Muddy Creek that has restored the fishery of you know, a arguably one of the most degraded watersheds in the country. And the North Fork Railroad Refuse Project that was uh, constructed several years ago is one of our, our really keystone projects. So we're at the beginning of our railroad refuse treatment site. As the water moves down the hill, it actually can lose some of its iron concentrations. It actually will go around this dog leg here. 
which is kind of a term for our open limestone channel where it's curving around. And the reason that we wanted this is because we wanted to maximize the amount of open limestone channel so that we're increasing the amount of limestone interacting with this mine water before it reaches the limestone leach bed. So once it makes it to the leach bed, it leaches its way through some additional limestone. Once that vault is full, it triggers a flush and then it makes its way to the settling pond. At the settling pond, usually now the pH is about five. And that's where you're seeing the aluminum precipitate out. That's what causes that kind of aqua color. And then from there, the water makes its way to this additional pond. This is our mushroom compost pond. This is kind of a new technology for FOC. And there's certain microbes in the mushroom compost that help um, improve the water quality further and help these metals continue to fall out. From here, it goes to the wetland, which is kind of our polishing component. So any remaining metals or sediment is kept in the wetland and sequestered before it makes its way to the stream. All right, we're gonna test the pH of our wetland, which is our final component of our treatment system. I'm just gonna set the probe in. And this site actually has a pretty good system out pH. At this point, uh, our water quality is showing that we are pH circumneutral, meaning we're um, often above seven with our effluent, um, which is good. We're actually producing alkalinity that will uh, further improve uh, North Fork of Green's run, and our metals are often non-detect or zero. An important improvement is when the DNR does fish surveys at area, different areas on the watershed, uh, usually above and below potential sources of pollution. And so when we measure the, uh, uh, the number of fish, the number of species of fish, the size of the fish, we can make comparisons uh, below sources of acid mine drainage and see how that affects the fish population. And when we've done this, and I've done this extensively on the Cheat River and on the Tigard River, it's a, a very, very obvious reduction in fish populations below sources of acid mine drainage. Water quality monitoring is foundational to everything Friends of the Cheat does. We have to collect data to understand what's happening in our rivers and streams to assess what the problems are and what we should do. One of the first things the organization did was invest in equipment and train volunteers to get out in the watershed and collect this data. Now we have a professionally trained staff and a robust mapping and monitoring program that not only samples water quality for acid mine drainage, but we're also looking at other impairments throughout the watershed, including um, bacteria, um, sediment, temperature. We need data. A good measure of the total diversity uh, in the watershed is the number of species of fish that we find. And so that's been well documented now. We're seeing probably 40 species of minnows and darters in Cheat Lake that we had never seen before. For many years, Friends of the Cheat staff stomped through streams, not finding anything. I mean, not even a water strider on the surface. So to be able to see fish return to streams like North Fork of Greens Run and to see trout at the mouth of Muddy Creek and the Cheat is the most rewarding part, I think, of our job. One thing that we at Friends of the Cheat try to emphasize is the importance that everything is connected. Um, everything down to your little stream bugs, your benthic macroinvertebrates, all the way up to uh, the bald eagle or your megafauna um, is connected through um, the ecosystem and really we try to emphasize the importance of these small organisms and what they mean in the watershed and how they can affect um, our species at the top of the food chain. So we tend to monitor some of these species that can be indicators of good or bad water quality depending on their presence or absence. Uh, one of those is the eastern hellbender which is a two foot long salamander uh, native to North America. 
they're, they're pretty much gentle giants and spend most of their lives under rocks in the stream and therefore are pretty good indications of good water quality when they're present in a system. So Friends of the Cheat recently conducted our first uh, environmental DNA monitoring effort this fall uh, to determine where these species may be present or absent in the Cheat River watershed. Two interesting things we've learned from this study. One, hellbenders were detected in areas that were historically dead for aquatic species, specifically the section from Rollsburg to Albright. This is just one more example of the successful restoration of the Cheat River. For the main stem to be able to support a pollution sensitive species like the hellbender is an immense achievement. The Albright Power Dam was built in 1952 to feed the coal-fired power plant's cooling towers. Not only is the Albright Power Dam a barrier for paddlers, it is also one for fish and other animals that live in the stream. Because of the efforts of many partners to improve the Cheat River over the decades, pollution-sensitive sport fish, such as walleye and smallmouth bass, are returning. But now the dam blocks the walleye's way upstream to river towns such as Rollsburg and Parsons. They shut down the power plant and now it's just sitting there as a relic. The dam literally has no dam purpose. It is just in the way. So now um, as we work to try and remove that dam, um, we're looking at species like not only trout but species like hellbender and even potentially introducing freshwater mussels back into the cheat. They also filter the water. So once you get mussels re-established, re you're, you're introducing a natural kind of pollution abatement uh, strategy there. So we're super excited. I mean, if you would have told the founders 26 years ago that we'd be talking about freshwater mussels and hellbenders, they probably would have thought you were crazy because 25 years ago, the river was dead. You couldn't pull a you couldn't pull a fish out of this river. You sat there for, for weeks. I mean, there was nothing living in there. Lick Run is a small yet immensely impactful tributary of the Cheat River. The Lick Run watershed drains an area less than five square miles, containing 22 known acid mine drainage discharges entirely from abandoned mine lands. The worst abandoned mine lands in this drainage is the Lick Run portals, an otherworldly site where damage from a vast underground mine complex exposes itself at the surface. The toxic waters emanating from the mine portals enter Lick Run from both sides of this creek, sending 500 gallons of acidic water downstream every minute. A mile and a half downstream, these severely polluted waters enter and mix with the Cheat River. In recent years, the West Virginia Department of Environmental Protection Office of Abandoned Mine Lands and Reclamation completed partial land reclamation at the site. Improving water quality through AMD remediation was not included in this work. Every year, Lick Run contributes nearly 5 million pounds of acidity to the cheat and hundreds of tons of toxic metals. It is one of the most severely concentrated sources of acid mine drainage to the Cheat River watershed. Estimates for a Lick Run portal treatment system range from 3 to 5 million, not including annual operations and maintenance costs. FOC is committed to bringing this massive project to fruition. A watershed is more than the rivers and streams that cross the landscape. A watershed includes the people that live there. So Friends of the Cheat has found ourselves not just working for the river, but working for the community. And as such, we found ourselves leading essentially economic development projects. The Cheat River Rail Trail, it's gonna be about eight miles of rail trail along the Cheat River. Um, this project was funded by the West Virginia DEP AML pilot program. Where this rail trail is, is kind of a really scenic section. It's actually a scenic byway, Route 72. Dovetailing with that is another project we have with the rail trail, and that'll be a trailhead. Uh, and that is another massive amount of money coming for us to help build out, again, the economic development of surrounding outdoor recreation. This trailhead, Plenty of parking, I think over 40 cars will be able to park there, and it'll provide foot travel, non-motorized again travel along the trail to the, along the banks of the Cheat. So you can scamper down the trail, get to your favorite fishing hole, you can ride your bike, you can view all the rapids, you can get in the water and swim 
um, in a safe way. And you're gonna have bathrooms, an ability to park your car, leave for the day, and enjoy the river on the trail. Um, so those, again, combined, that's over $4 million worth of construction projects and infrastructure projects in Preston County along the river. So that brings jobs, that brings local uh, you know, opportunity for outfits to work, and then uh, with, with that comes people, and people are gonna buy things, they're gonna buy bikes, they're gonna buy food, they're gonna buy ice cream at the ice cream shop. You, know, you build it and they come. We have the Allegheny Trail that runs through West Virginia. It's 330 miles, uh, and it starts up at the Mason-Dixon line and then goes south to the border of Virginia, where actually we'll meet the Appalachian Trail. Uh, and Friends of the Cheat recently became a steward of the Allegheny Trail. We have a 28 mile section that runs from again Mason-Dixon line uh, down here to around uh, Albright is where we're, we're, we're taking care of it. And we host uh, trail groups to come and do trail work. Uh, the popular section here is the Cheat Canyon. It's about 10 miles of wilderness. Uh, folks like to get in there and backpack and hike and just explore nature at its best. As we've moved forward with building our own recreation infrastructure, the rail trail, paddling access, the trailhead, we found ourselves really at the tip of the spear leading economic development initiatives around outdoor recreation. And as such, Friends of the Chi, in partnership with Downstream Strategies, is working to build out the state's first non-motorized trail network modeled after uh, the Hatfield-McCoy trail system in southern West Virginia, but this is for non-motorized trails. What's that mean? The best for bikes and the best for boats. And we're going to see in coming years a large investment, I've been told, by tourism professionals. We're, we're going to be making actually the largest investment in tourism infrastructure and marketing that North Central West Virginia has ever seen as part of this project. There's a lot to be said about Friends of the Cheat annual fundraiser, the Cheat River Festival. Uh, we had our first one in 1994, the same year that the organization formed, and it has been a huge outreach event by the banks of the beautiful Cheat River ever since. Each year, three to 4,000 people visit this site on the first weekend of May to celebrate the mighty Cheat River. People come in from all over the world. It is the kickoff to the summer paddling season. The Cheat River Festival is really integral to FSC's budget, yearly budget. Uh, it can raise up to 40% of our unrestricted fundraising. We don't only need jobs, but we need a place where people want to live. And people want to live where there are nice things to do outside and where they have a community that they feel part of. And that's what Friends of the Cheat has, has grown, you know, maybe not intentionally, but naturally, organically, um, through events like Cheat Fest, where we have folks gather together along the river to celebrate, and that brings hope. The cheat is, you know, my son's cliche, but it's an, it's an inspirational story. A river that was dead in my lifetime is back. You know, we didn't have, we didn't have fish. No one wanted to go into the Cheat Canyon, and now um, people are, are coming back. So we want to hold that up as a, an example that, Truly a committed group of people who picked up a bunch of scrap metal and had $20 in a mason jar on top of a fridge can implement change, real change, lasting change. And I think that human capital and that those kind of intangible things, we can't necessarily measure that. You can measure pH, you can collect fish, but how do you measure the morale? You know, how do you measure inspiring other people, you know, friends of Deckers, friends of Blackwater, all these other groups just in our region and nationally. You know, not only have we restored water quality, but habitat, I mean, we're making moves. For all of the success we've had, and by success I mean the river, right? The river is healthier, that the species are back, things are improving. 
but we do see setbacks. We do have setbacks. Um, the incident that happened on Muddy Creek last year, we saw a big surge of very polluted acid mine drainage coming down the cheat into the canyon. I mean, it was it was very reminiscent of 1994. I mean, people were upset. Um, people were concerned. Now, the impact of that has been minimal, um, but that really impacts kind of your resolve more than anything. Um, cleaning up acid mine drainage isn't one and done. It's a marathon. As long as there's pyritic material, we're going to have AMD. So you really have to be committed, and you do have to have thick skin. You do have to, you know, be able to weather the storm and uh, really dig your heels in that this matters. We're not going to give up. Travel this world near far and wide.